I thought, oh, but thanks so much, Alexis. I'm telling you, I will probably forget every single day. Uh, <laughs> I was writing down notes and I was like, is this recorded? <laughs> okay, I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so Colin, here's another example. Do you know after World War II, do you know about the Marshall Plan? Uh, a little bit. Okay, so after World War II, George Marshall uh, decided, okay, after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles was very punitive. And the French especially wanted to like drive Germany into the ground so that they would never rise up again. <laughs> well, that didn't work at all. And so after World War II, George Marshall came and he gave money and he gave it to the Germans to rebuild. He didn't allow any Americans to make $1 off of that. And so Germany uh, today is very strong, right? They used their own engineers. All they needed was money and they rebuilt themselves. And we haven't been at war with them, right? So um, then in the Iraq war, we, it was called a, um, it was compared, the, the rebuilding program was called, was said to be analogous, but actually it wasn't at all. It was 80 billion bucks, 60 billion was just to keep our troops safe, 20 billion was supposedly to rebuild Iraq, almost every cent was American profits, Halliburton especially, the vice president's company. And so it was completely the opposite. Has that worked out very well? No, not really. <laughs> okay. So my point is just, there is a whole history of people thinking about should you help your enemy, your former enemy develop, would that be better for overall diplomacy and peacekeeping? And also the principle of the thing, if everybody is by nature equal, we shouldn't treat other people as if they're subhuman. Does that make sense to you, Colin? Okay, so my point mainly is that there is a whole body of knowledge based on questions like that. So, um, so Alexis, what about you? Sorry, one second, I'm writing something down. Um, I really just wanted to kind of question like how like, so the whole thought process about the Greeks being um, their own democracy and how like it needed to be fair. I just wanted, I wanted to like ask if you can go into more detail about it. Cause like from what I, from what I understood what you said, it was learned from the gods or did I understand that wrong? Okay. All right. So the uh, it was more that, of a question. What? It was more of a question, not something I took from the class um but i was just wondering like exactly how did they think oh well the government and the court have to be equal they can't judge off how much everyone makes and stuff like that which is kind of like more like that's higher society kind of education how did something that we today are still struggling with was thought back so far away so far back. Okay, good for you. <laughs> Aren't you a little bit surprised at how, you know, they well, understood the basic principles? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it's so shocking to me, like how something, not that I'm saying that their education or like their knowledge was lesser, it's just after all this time, this simple process that was thought like like years ago by the Greeks is still not implanted worldwide. It's still being like discussed and growing and stuff. 
Yeah. One of the issues there, anybody else want to comment on that? Was anybody surprised about um, okay, so I used to spend my summers in Greece, and um, I, I always go to the Agora, and I just, I'm just sort of awed by how insightful they were about what you need to do to develop citizen consciousness, and, and we are losing it, right? We've, ever since 9-11, we've violated a whole lot of those principles, or we've broken down trust and goodwill and we've polarized our people. We've done the opposite of what they knew you needed to do if you want a stable society. Is that kind of what you're getting at, Alexis? Mm -hmm. um, I remember one day I was climbing up the Acropolis and this woman and her family were coming down and she just said, honey, this is amazing. <laughs> I'll never forget that because there's a lot of flaws in the Greek stuff, but that basic insight of what you have to do to avoid polarization um, is, is, I, is great. I mean, I think that's one of the things that made it great. But the thing about learning from the gods was that people would have blind religion, right? So whenever something bad happens, some people would say, well, it must be Zeus's will, right? It must be God's will. And you don't use your brain. You know, you don't try to think about it. You don't try to ask why. You don't try to fix it. Do you know anybody who, when something happens, they'll just say it's God's will and we're not supposed to question it. Yeah, <laughs> my grandma. <laughs> anybody else know anybody like that? Okay, so I think intuitively you can understand this. It's where you separate reason from faith and you just say God is in control, even though it sure looks like innocent people are dying and all this stuff that, you know, you wouldn't think God would do, but you just believe it. Well, the, the Greeks, the way they, I mean, there were plenty of literalist Greeks like that, blind faith, but the way the myths worked was that the gods disagreed with each other and, and the gods were using reasoning and arguments to support their views. And so people were disagreeing about what the gods wanted. And so they would have to notice that, you know what? We're acting just like the gods. And so it would occur to them that the gods are not literal. The gods are these powers of the psyche that we have. They're personifications of our own intellectual capacities. Does that make sense, Alexis? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm writing that down. I think I'm going to include that in my 200 words. It's kind of like, not to get political, but it's kind of like how things are now. Because in our own government, we are struggling from separating religion from court and their justice system. So it's kind of like everything's having like a 100, 360, like it's coming all back around that we're still having a Greeks moment where we need to come to the realization. I'm writing it down. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court decisions recently are um, include a lot more about God than they used to. Um, and, and, um, I guess you can pray after a football game now. Uh, it's protected speech. And I, I do have to just give you an FYI that our founding fathers were really obsessed with separating church and state because they knew that if you start putting them together, you can have corrupt politicians saying God's will or I love God and getting away with a lot of stuff. So there is the letter concerning toleration is distinguishing these two things really step by step by step. Why 
this is your religious belief, what you can say to people, and this is um, your political when you're acting like a citizen. So obviously the Supreme Court justices we have now have a different interpretation of the relationship between church and state than the ones we had before. So it's become controversial again. Um, and and, and I, I'm happy that you, you can see that's the same pattern. The Greeks wrestled with that same stuff. Um, do you remember in the lecture I said, after it became corrupt, when Zeus was throwing the thunderbolt, right? So when things were going pretty well, there were speculative thinkers who were looking for natural causes for the universe and nobody bothered with them. They're just, you know, a bunch of weirdos. But when they were trying to, when they were declining, then the fundamentalists went after them and said, God is punishing us because those people don't have faith. And the reason for lightning bolts is Zeus. It's not some kind of electrochemical natural cause. So um, does it make sense to you, Alexis, that we are in that same kind of downward spiral? Mm -hmm. Like, this is like having like an off, all off, off moment. <laughs> okay, so the next reading is about um, a religious leader that made a decision and justified it with God and everybody else was totally shocked. But I'll get to that in a minute. But that's the issue we're going to talk about next time. Um, Zane, what did you come up with? Um, I kind of find it interesting about like the part like like where the Spartanians like when it came to war, like they were talking about like how for them, like the most honorable thing was for their son to like, you know, be a warrior and stuff like that, you know, even be a general and grow up, you know, to be like a political figure. And then the Athenians like looked as war as like a way to like keep peace and stuff like that. And like they they found that like, you know, just terrible and stuff like that. But uh, I kind of find that not like not just going with war like today, but like just other things like you know, people can like fall like obsessed with too much of something like that's, you know, meant for good. But, you know, if you just fall in love with it too much, you know, just let that overtake everything. And you just kind of look over the whole purpose of it. <laughs> Very good. Have you had an experience like that? Oh, uh, kind of, kind of like that. Just kind of like people kind of like, like taking like power for granted and stuff like that. Kind of like what we're talking about. Like just kind of, it just kind of falls apart from within, you know, so Stuff like okay, that. very good. Um, so I, you know, I hope, you know, the spark, the light of your mind goes off and you go, oh, what is this? Okay, so Zane, here's the thing for you. Um, I think in Athens, there were, there were people who basically were Spartans in their souls. So Lakey's, for example, he really secretly valued, uh, honor in war more than he valued all this bullshit poetry stuff, you know? <laughs> Do you think there are some Americans that really, that's really the way, you know, sacrificing for your country and those damn liberals are just a bunch of promiscuous artistic hoity-toities. <laughs> Does that happen? No. <laughs> okay, so do you understand that? The, okay, very good. Um, and the thing is, they're, they're partly true, right? It's partly true that those liberals are degenerates and they, they don't make sacrifices. Some of them are, right? But it's also partly true that the Spartans, Spartan types um, are too quick to value war, right? And the politicians can make use of that. So in case you haven't noticed, politicians always, we need more military spending, right? That always sells, like you can get votes if you say that. Okay, so I want you to tell me how much money per person you think we spend on military and then compare that to diplomacy. Okay, Zane, everybody's got a clock in. How much on military 
And how much on diplomacy? All right, per person. What do you say, Zane? Oh, I got no idea. I mean, I would definitely say probably more on military, but like, I don't even know like a number to like private store. I would say quite a bit. I would say quite a bit with how much we spend. What's quite a bit? Uh, I mean, I would say, I mean, it's, I would say it's at least in the thousands probably. How many thousand? Uh, I'll just go with, I'll just go with five, maybe five. 5,000 per person. So you multiply 5,000 times 300 million. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I, I, I don't say. I don't even. Know, I don't even know a number to start at. So. That's, but that's fine, Zane. Except that, don't you guys realize if you don't know this, those politicians can just punch your buttons. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think you ought to just have <laughs> just the general idea in the back of your mind, right? Um. All right. right. So, well, how many billions of bucks do you think per year? What sounds like a good number? Mm, I'll go with like 15. Okay, 15 billion. Okay. And then how much for diplomacy do you think? Shoot, I don't even know. Uh, I would say it'd be less probably. I, I would I'd probably go like two, maybe two billion. I don't know. Okay. All right. Okay, Colin. You're an American citizen. You should know this. Um, don't we spend like a hundred billion for uh, military? Then like ten billion for diplomacy. Okay. What do you think, Alexis? I did a like favor on this. So I know off the top of my head that we are in the 800 billions for military. That's like around like 3K per person. That's just on military. I would say on diplomacy, I'm just guessing it'd probably be like two, two to three billion and 1k 1000 1, on per person that's okay. just a guess oh yes <laughs> okay uh ryan um honestly i have shamefully no clue but i'm gonna assume like three thousand per person i think the numbers um lexi gave is probably <laughs> accurate um it's probably a lot. I know it is in the village, but I, I mean, I heard that I don't remember any of the numbers, but I did hear that the military spending was just insane. And how much, wait, you have to lean in a little bit to your computer. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think Lexi's numbers that she gave was pretty accurate. Um, I heard, I mean, I've seen like, you know, little videos of it, but I can't remember any of the numbers they gave, but I know it's like in the billions. And I'm going to 3,000 per person. I feel like that's a safe number. 2,000? Three. Oh, three. Okay. Um, what about you, Michael? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I was going to agree with about 3,000. I was thinking we were probably closing in on a trillion. So that's relatively close um, for military. And then probably like... Uh, I don't know, maybe like a hundred million total, um, for diplomacy. Yeah, but that that seems quite steep. Uh, maybe it's not though. I don't. I don't know. Okay, Tim, you got a guess? Honestly, I don't really have a number, but um, I would just say. I don't know. It's, it's a lot, though. I don't really have a number, though, because I, I don't know anything about it like that. Okay. Anybody else? Everybody guessed? Okay. Now I have one other question. There is a National Endowment for the Humanities, and that's where the government pays maybe for a puppeteer or an orchestra to come into a public school and play, or the kids get to go to a theater performance or something like that, or 
I, in the summertime, uh, faculty members get to go to little summer, summer schools with people in their, in their field, or you might fund, the government will fund um, people who are working on histories of underreported people like indigenous people, people who haven't other, nobody has enough money to pay a historian to write their history, you know, National Endowment for the Humanities, just to kind of cultivate um, history and scholarship and citizen engagement, opportunities for poorer kids to get engaged in the arts. How much do you think per person? National Endowment for the Arts, I mean, the humanities, and then there is one for the arts. I just, I, you have to guess. <laughs> okay, Colin. Uh, maybe $5 billion. How much per person would that be? Per person. Um, Actually, that would just be $15 per person. I think one billion probably yeah, is three dollars and thirty cents is one billion. So yeah, anywhere between three dollars to maybe like yeah, I'd say probably like twenty bucks per person, somewhere around there. Okay, like max. Okay, and national endowment for the arts. Um, I'm gonna go less. I'm probably gonna say like ten dollars per person. Okay. I guess, I mean, we're going to run out of time. So, well, the last I heard, Alexis, and uh, it's fine with me, you're probably, they do count it differently, was about 2,600 per person, but it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> um, but diplomacy, the last I saw was $40 per person, okay? National Endowment for the Humanities, 80 cents, National Endowment for the Arts, 40 cents. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, but there's a philosophy behind that. There are people who think we shouldn't, I shouldn't have to pay one cent of taxpayer money for that stupid socialist National Endowment for the Arts or Humanities, because the only reason to have government is military and police. <laughs> People think that, okay? So I'm just telling you, just so that the next time a politician tries to punch your buttons, like if you just, you know, have a little bit of perspective on it. Um, all right, Zane, so thanks. I obviously followed through on that a little bit too much. Um, Tim. Well, I was kind of, um fascinated with the I'm not, the rule of law I don't know how to call it Urchitheme it's called Urchitheme, rule of law something like that how did you spell it? E-R-E-C-H-T-H-E-I-O-N oh yeah the courthouse yeah I'm not I can't really grasp it too well but it's kind of interesting what I like a little bit I was okay. trying to ask, like, could you explain more about it? Okay. About how what happens? Yeah. Well, okay. So think about all of your relationships with other people. You have family and extended family. And the purpose of that is to raise those kids and keep them on the straight and narrow, right? And then the, there's economic association. There's the businesses and profit driven enterprises and you relate to people at that level. Then there's another level where people um, make laws related to distribution of wealth, right? Because at the economic level, money sticks to money and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so at a higher level, you can actually want a strong middle class, a polis. You want people that everybody has enough of what they need and they have leisure time so they can participate in public life. They have time to become informed, things like that. Then um, 
the other part of the court system is um, criminal law, right? Civil law, somebody breaks the law. And so when they had a jury, they're telling you that you have the capacity to make these decisions. Because before that, it was just the monarch who made the decisions or the monarch's appointees or this aristocratic class. And so the average Joe was completely written out and not, not given any opportunity to use that capacity. He was told he didn't have the capacity, right? Just like African-Americans were locked out and they were told they don't have the capacity, right? Does that make sense? And so there it is up there telling you, you not only do you have the capacity, you have the responsibility. You need to learn how to listen to lawyers, to assess evidence, to create arguments, to draw conclusions, because the fate of that person who's charged is in your hands, right? There isn't a monarch. Nobody else is going to do it. And Athena doesn't do it for you either, but she gives you the tools. You have the capacity to do this, but you have to you have to use that capacity to rule for the sake of people you don't know personally. And you can't favor the people you know. You have to treat everybody as an equal. And that's a certain kind of mental capacity that's more sophisticated, more developed than either family systems or economic systems. Does that make sense, Tim? Okay, good. Um, so you were interested in that, that they understood, they had this idea of political community and learning how to, yeah, okay. That was their political genius. Um, Michael. Yeah, was your initial question just uh, like a, a point that we brought from the- Right, that's right. Um, let's see. Um, I, what did I talk about in your questions? Uh, one of the things I talked about uh, with regards to the ancient Greeks uh, connecting with like the current US system was when you talk, you discussed like the jury system that they used uh, and how they did it completely, like basically random uh, randomization of, of people uh, and how that we, we somewhat still have that uh, today. Uh, in our uh, judicial system as well. Um, yeah, you also, you talked about a point later in the video about, um, you were talking about freedom. You are talking about freedom within a society um, and uh, how basically uh, too much freedom in a free society or something along those lines. Um, but I hadn't kind of picked that apart just yet. It would be if you interpret freedom to mean the license to live however you like, right? right? Yes, and so, yeah, you all have to think about this. The original reason to give people freedom was so that they would develop their capacity for practical wisdom, right? So they, I mean, it was a responsibility, but it got interpreted to mean, I don't have to care about anybody else. Freedom means you want to get rich. Hey, come to Athens, you can get rich. You want to just be self-indulgent. We're not going to judge you. Fine. You want to gain power. You know, that's your prerogative. If you can get other people to follow you, well, good for you. You're good at it. You're successful. If you want to be famous or infamous, if you want to be an influencer on social media, you know, it's just whatever you want to do. And then other people will honor whatever it is that whoever does things that they sort of admire. And it's just an absolute free for all. And so the system can't handle it because somebody's got to care about the well-being of everyone. You know, what do children need? What about the education? What about the healthcare? How are we gonna 
get our the public to have a middle class and flourish even if i i myself could go off and make big bucks i don't want to do that i want to figure out how to maintain a flourishing society does that do you all understand the issue here how many of you yeah good okay ryan why don't you go because you haven't gone yet oh yeah i just have a comment about that i think it's just it's just really hard because it's like if you're in that mindset of not i mean if i could do something to make myself succeed but yet it will be better for the benefit of most people if not everybody's in that same mindset then like i feel like it's hard to do that in this day and age because if you don't do that then you might lose opportunities to get ahead and you're gonna have to move up and talk slower uh, okay i was just saying that in this society it's gonna be really hard to do that because like if everybody's not in the same mindset and like you're trying to benefit the, the the majority, yet other people may take that opportunity to benefit themselves. Uh, you may be just stuck in a circle of not saying you shouldn't be giving, 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 but like you may be stuck uh, being in a place where you're not able to say, sustain yourself or other people might get ahead. I guess it's just what you value in life. Like for me, I'm just going to be honest, like I do value like I do value being more than comfortable. Like I want to raise my kids through traveling and I know that needs money. So for me, like I'm going to go into law, but I have to be strategic on what kind of law I'm going into. And like one part of me wants to go into like immigration and, you know, like social justice and things like that. I just work with minorities and groups that's not able to afford, you know, having these quality um, educated lawyers and stuff like that in representation. But then another part of me is like, you know, I'm going to school for seven plus years and being in debt, like I need to pay, pay everything back. So I think it's just really hard to balance the two, especially in the age. Yeah, actually, we're going to read an article about this, um, about the problem of student debt and things like that. Um, I mean, my only advice, okay, so Socrates did tell this, the student, the, his students, they should pick, find out what they're good at and, and uh, exercise that capacity for the well-being of everyone. But I guess what I'd say right now to students because of the loan issue and all that, first of all, life is long, <laughs> you know? And okay, so I'm almost 70, but I plan on working in some capacity for another 15 years. Um, so you can do, you can and also when your kids are little you might not want to do corporate law because you're never home right so you might want to do some kind of a less uh intense job when your kids are little then you want to might want to uh, move toward a more intense when you, you need more income and then you might want to do pro bono work <laughs> later on right you don't have to answer that question once and for all Plus, um, if you just want money, you're going to end up working with people who are who just want money, and they're not going to be very fun to work with, you know. Um, so you kind of become like the company you keep, right? Like the you know the immigration lawyers are probably be pretty nice people, but <laughs> because they're making these sacrifices, right? But I mean, I I guess I think you should just be ready to be adaptable. And you don't have to answer that question once and for all. But I do think that is a is a big problem. My kids are 40 and 43 and they're still paying their debts. And, you know, I didn't have to do that because philosophy grad school was not very expensive because you can't make any money. <laughs> so the more, the more money you can make, with that degree, the more expensive the degree is. And so again, that just pushes people into being greedy, right? The system really rewards greed and it really punishes you if you're not greedy. It's just, it's annoying. Um, but anyway, does that, does that help at all with what you're figuring out? Okay, 
Um, does anybody have another comment that they, from their reading that they wanted to bring up? Because if not, I'll go through, you know, an outline or so, and every once in a while, I'll stop and say, okay, who wants to comment on that? Go ahead, Ryan. Um, when I was going through one of the documents, it, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, just lean in. Okay. okay. Um, when I was going through the documents, it was talking about the comparison between, was it Jesus and Socrates? Oh, yeah. The comparison. I think that's really interesting because right now I'm in my spiritual quest and I'm reading the Bible now. I'm starting with the New Testament. And I think it's really interesting because the question you posed was, how uh how can like the most holiest man be persecuted for being unholy and i think that just led me to like it made, made me question about like how fear how like how fear changes people and how it can control people and also like the idea of like uh what i say uh the like the power of like mass opinion and like you could even see that right before jesus was persecuted um <coughs> at first he, they didn't want to persecute him but it was all the people that rallied around and said no he needs to be crucified and that's why was it caesar he had to like wash his hands and says i have no i have no part of this because i think this man is is a, should be a free man like maybe he doesn't deserve crucifixion but yet because everybody questioned him and was having an uproar and he didn't want to have an uproar he had to like succumb to what the pop like the majority wanted yeah actually the passion play I'm sure that they knew this. It follows exactly the pattern of a Greek tragedy, okay? Um, and the issue here with, with Socrates, and we'll talk about this uh, two days from now, the apology, or at the end of tomorrow, is that Socrates is defending his way of life. And he has, there are the Athenians, just like the, the masses, who originally on uh, Palm Sunday, they liked him, right? They hailed him and, you know, they had the palm branches and all that. And then it was the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right? The religious leaders that used rhetoric, <laughs> used speech making to turn the masses against Jesus. Um, so they had good intentions, but they got manipulated. And the people in power, uh, they either knew Jesus was good and he was making them look bad, or he just wasn't literal enough. And they really did think he's evil because he said, really, chuck all the laws, love God and love your neighbor and forget all the other stuff. Well, I mean, that doesn't go over very well with an authority whose job is to tell you <laughs> all these things. Um, but anyway, so the same thing happened in Athens is that um, the Athenians had to vote on whether Socrates should be killed or not. And it was a close vote, but Meletus was a literalist and Socrates didn't believe in the city's gods. And so he had to go. And at the end of the day, they were, they made a tragic mistake, right? They voted to kill the good guy. So then you can think about that yourself. Have you ever had an experience where what the evil people get called good and good people get called evil? And then you have to ask, well, do I ever do that? Could I do that? Could I just resent someone for being too virtuous? Um, so it is, it's written for everybody to think twice because um, otherwise they're gonna make a mistake. Does that help? Does that answer? So that's, it's good. There's a lot of analogies. Um, anybody else have something they wanna bring up before I just start talking and you can respond? I'll quit every 10 or 15 minutes, I hope, knock on wood. <laughs> I'm not good at quitting talking, but all right. So let me tell you a few stories about the gods here, juicy stories. 
So um, Zeus, the god of justice. Well, and he was married to Hera, the goddess of honor. So when this works, this would be like the president and the first lady or the first husband. So um, in the past, until recently, um, the president's wife would do, do things like, well, Michelle Obama worked on um, having a garden and encouraging people to eat correctly. And Laura Bush was working on uh, libraries and getting in, improving literacy. And it, believe it or not, Melania Trump was working on bullying, <laughs> trying to stop uh, people from bullying, except her husband. <laughs> and um, so it was just like that. In general, you'd have the wife of the CEO and she would get on the school board and the, I said that before, right? Well, Zeus used to uh, chase after beautiful young uh, nymphs or goddesses and get them pregnant. And then Hera would get really annoyed. And so instead of going after Zeus, she went after the women. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think some women do that? They can't confront their husband. Okay, so right. <laughs> so <laughs> they blame the woman, right? Because in a patriarchy, women are always pitted against other women. And the men still exercise all the power. So um, not only that, but Hera got so mad at him once that Poseidon, no, Hades wanted to run to take over. And Hera was so mad at Zeus that she seduced him and he fell asleep and then Hades took over. <laughs> so this, the analogy there is that there are a lot of powerful men who probably tell their wives, you know, pillow talk, some pretty intimate things. And if they go and cheat on the wife, the wife could maybe spill some beans, you know, that would really harm the society. They, it might be security questions or it might be all sorts of other stuff. And so the story there is warning powerful men, you know, don't do this. It causes a lot of harm that Zeus raped Demeter and Persephone was born and Zeus um, had an affair with Semele and Dionysus was born and he's the wild child. And so then Zeus tries to get all these gods together in one place and do what he tells them. And of course, why should they, you know? You don't, you know, you do whatever you want. How come I can't do whatever I want? So that's, that's what those stories are about. They're not encouraging powerful men to do this. They're saying you might have a fantasy about this, right? You might want to have sex with beautiful young goddesses or women, and, but you've got to flush that out of your system. This is, it destroys social and political life. You're undermining your own um, justice, right? So nobody's going to listen to you if you live as you like. So that's one of the themes. Um, uh, let's see, Ares, the god of war. He's the one that wants, he's the Spartan type, right? And he just wants to prove how, how powerful he is. But he does a lot of harm. And he has a double-edged sword and kills people on both sides. And both, and Zeus, Athena, and Hera all condemn him. And so the message there is, it's not honorable to um, engage, to go from uh, prevention in war, defensive war, to uh, brutality, okay? In warlike situations, uh, fear, again, there's a trigger of fear, like there is even in civil life. And people can become very brutal, brutalized. And so the story of Aries is a story of, you know, catch yourself 
if you feel like you just want to go and mow people down with a gun because you're getting so paranoid about about getting hurt. Um, and then Dionysus, I told you that already, right? He dies and he's reborn. But the story I wanted to tell you here was Aphrodite cheats. <laughs> Aphrodite is married to um, Hephaestus, the god of the forge. And he's very shy and introverted. And she cheats on him. And she runs away with Ares. And then they fight so much that she goes back to Hephaestus. And then she gets bored. And then Ares comes along. And there they go. So that is the typical Hollywood um, plot, right? You have to have sex and aggression, or you're never going to make any money. <laughs> So there, they, sex and aggression um, are attracted to each other, but they are the two most powerful forces that destroy civilization. There's like throwing a bomb in the middle of a society, violence, and then uh, sexual infidelity, which is sometimes very aggressive, but it just breaks down relationships. It breaks down families. And, it, and that's like the cornerstone of stability in a society. And so it breaks down everything. So there's that story. Then there's the story of Apollo. He's the god of reason. And this is the, um, the CEO that is very rational. He knows how to run a good business, but it just, he's very efficient. But he just so happens to be selling uh, biological weapons or something. But that isn't, you know, what he sells isn't what matters to him. What matters to him is he runs a good company. And then every, I remember reading about the editor of Time magazine, and he was getting married. Well, this was his fourth marriage and her third marriage. So every 10 years or so, he trades her in for a younger model, right? And um, has children and they had children fight over the, who gets to rule the company after he leaves. Uh, Fox News is right in the middle of one of these <laughs> because the guy, Rupert Murdoch was married to one woman for 35 years and he had three kids. But then he got divorced and married a much younger woman she had two kids and she wants her kids to get a chunk of change. And those, the, the older ones don't. So they're having this fight over the family fortune. Um, and so all those stories, another story about Apollo is that he, he cheated and he had a son named Phaedon, uh, I think his name was, but anyway, he felt guilty about cheating and about not being home, right? He's not there to raise his kid. So he tells the kid, you can have whatever you want, you know? Well, the kid wanted to drive the chariot with the sun in it across the sky, which is what Apollo does. And Apollo said, no, you know, you're not a God. Like you're, you're not, you're not going to be able to do that. He said, dad, you told me I get to do, you know, I, so he did and he crashed it and everything fell apart. Well, what's that about? That's about guys that have affairs, they have kids, they're never there for them, they feel guilty about it. And they end up spoiling them, right? Giving them things that those kids shouldn't have. Power, a lot of it is power, like putting them in a position to govern in a company where they don't really know what they're doing. They're just the spoiled brat rich kid, you know? Um, and then Artemis, the woods woman, those are those girls that loved horses I mean, or they love sports. They're very competitive. And um, they also are midwives and they help in the birth of other of babies of all sorts. But they, they are also man haters. And so Artemis hated Aphrodite because she's the sexy goddess, right? And Artemis just turns into a man hater. And um, Aphrodite had a crush on, geez, I can't remember the name, 
Um, but anyway, a young man. And just to spite her, um, uh, Artemis had him turned into a, a rabbit and then chased by her dogs and eaten up by dogs. And that's, you know, that's that shock treatment. Like, okay, Artemis, you have 10 million reasons to think men are awful because of the awful things they do, but you really shouldn't go that far. Um, then, oh, anyway, um, let's see. I guess I'll, I'll quit there and see if anybody has any comments. Did you all grow up learning the stories of the myths? Okay, all right. So Alexis, um, when you learned those stories, did you think of them as actually explaining human behavior? I used to study them and I used to take them as like life lessons, so I guess, yeah. I used to, um, would I would watch, I used to have books, little kids books that like had each um, Greek god and goddess and like what to learn from them. And my mom let me read them because they would teach me things on what to do and what not to do. And, and literally at the end of the book, it said life lessons that you learn from the book. So I guess in a sense, yes. Very good. Um, so do you know what's the name of the series or anything? No, but I can try to look it up. Okay. Um, it's like a little quick, thin book, and it's got like the cartoon goddesses. It's got some false things in it to appeal to like young kids. I think it was like ages eight to 12 or eight and up. Yeah. Well, my um, grandson read this Percy Granger. Is, it, is there some pretty famous guy? Percy Jackson. Read? Yeah, okay. Anyway, I was talking to him the other day about the deities and asking him. And then I said, well, your mom is Athena. That's pretty obvious. But what about your dad? And all of a sudden it occurred to him like it had not occurred to him before. Oh, he's Vulcan. He's Hephaestus. He's always working downstairs in the basement and uh, the carpentry. And <laughs> so he is definitely the craftsman. And, and my grandson, it's just like the light went off um, and it really does explain his dad a lot. Um, okay, so Colin, did you ever learn any of those myths? Kinda, yeah. Um, I learned more about like the adventures of like them adventuring and things of that nature uh, with a little bit of the God sprinkled here and there. But I was kind of more interested in the people living in that time than the gods that they were worshiping. Okay, here's my question for you. You are oh, Apollonian and your lab partners, all people in those labs like that are Apollonian, right? They have Apollonian souls. Um, are, are all of them also emotionally mature? Um, yes and no. Like there's some who are and there's some who aren't. Okay. But it's most of the time just depending on the reactions that you're running and things of that nature and like if things are falling in line or not okay um all right because sometimes people who can be really smart intellectually but they can their morals vary a lot they can be motivated by greed or power or fame or pleasure or, and they can treat women the way they treat women. Um, sometimes it's very egalitarian. Um, Apollo, I mean, sometimes the relationships are more like brother-sister relationships, like Apollo and Artemis. Uh, but sometimes Apollo chased around a lot of nymphs also. 
And the thing about him, when he chased a nymph, if she ever rejected him, he took revenge. Like he was nasty if he was rejected. And I've had students tell me they know Apollonian type boys like that. Do you know any Apollonian boys like that? Yeah, I know one or two, okay. but it's not. I, I don't know a whole bunch. Okay. I mean, the older you get, the more this sort of plays out, I think, because in that's why I like teaching college students, because the world, you know, they're just starting. Almost everything you've done before college is habit, custom, imitation. You didn't have a lot of choice about where you're going to live or who you're going to know. All of a sudden you get to college and you can really start to be yourself or figure out what you want or uh, maybe make mistakes, but you have a lot of options you didn't have before. So, um, Michael, did you ever read these things? Uh, I read the Percy Jackson books um, as well. Um, I actually talked about that in the questions that you asked us. Um, but obviously those are fiction. I mean, somewhat fiction. Well, no, they're fiction, but you do get to learn like I guess about the the Greek the Greek gods and um, I mean the premise of the books is that there's a bunch of these half blood children running around, which kind of tells you how like the uh, the uh, the gods were getting down with not their partners. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so mestizos half and half, huh? Okay. Um, do you ever remember any lessons from any of those or were they just stories? Uh, it's been a very, very long time. Since that's I... okay. Nothing that's stuck in your mind. Yeah, nothing. Um, what about you, Tim? Um, I don't really know too much about that stuff. I've heard of it, but when I was younger, since I didn't really see it, I just didn't believe it as much. But I had a sense that it was kind of true. But I'm the type of person, if I don't see it, I'm not going to believe it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think in the Bible, there are characters who are like their archetypes. And the gods are archetypes also. So um, uh, Mary and Martha, like the story of Mary and Martha is an archetype where Jesus tells Martha she should get out of the kitchen and get in the living room and get serious. Uh, because that's, you know, that's related to these patterns that we fall into in life. And it is kind of interesting that there is that story because it means Jesus treated women as equals, spiritual equals. So he was very ahead of his time on that. Um, Anyway, I mean, I, my dad was a minister, so I, that must have sunk in. My name is Martha. So I have no interest in cooking at all. <laughs> and so I have an interest in going in the living room and talking about ideas. So I, I, just to recognize that these archetypes play out in your life, you're not alone. And um, there are these patterns and becoming aware of them is, is helpful because a lot of times, when when you have experiences described by the myths, you feel really isolated and alone. And if you can figure out, oh, no, this happens to everybody or a lot of people. Um, Zane, do you have something? Uh, yeah, kind of like when I was younger, like in fourth grade, they made like make us like read the Percy Jackson books, kind of like what you said, stuff like that. And we had to like watch the movies. So like I'm familiar with like the names and stuff like that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Did it glorify heroism, however? Uh, I mean, kind of. I mean, I wasn't really big into it back when I was like eight. So, I mean, I was okay. just kind of. No, I have students who said, there's some movie called the 400 or the 500 or something. And it sort of glorifies Achilles. And I'm telling you, Achilles is an anti-hero hero, guys. <laughs> 
he's you're not supposed to imitate this guy the reasons first of all he refuses to go to war and causes all this suffering and the reason he does it just to just get back at agamemnon and show him who's in charge so it's a power struggle and then when he finally does decide to go he does to take revenge on his friend to show agamemnon who's really in charge and to get glory at home why is that bad everyone will declare war about everything if that's their motive people will always go to war because does everybody understand that it's serious you should not reward you should not teach kids to just honor glory and war because then you're going to have unnecessary wars just so people can get honor tim yes i just remembered my mom well you said something about the gods and stuff and my mom watched this show and i started watching it not too long ago it's called stargate i kind of has something to do with that stuff with um like gods and stuff and aries and stuff like that okay. but i don't know if that means anything but I, well i, I mean the thing that. about it is that a lot of that hollywood if it gets hollywood eyes it ends up teaching you the wrong lesson <laughs> the opposite of what homer expected but that's okay the athenians stopped learning the lessons from their text also so what else is new okay would, would so you now say, um i have a question so would you say like the stuff that would you say they need to like reteach that stuff more authentically or you think how it is now is okay well actually i wanted to ask my students because the, i mean legitimately i i liked this stuff you know that's why i went into it many decades ago but the question is is it just not relevant anymore you know is it have we gotten so high tech that that i mean i'm open to that also it's true that they were sexist and racist and white supremacist and all that that's why you know i teach it as compellingly as i can i teach it for why i liked it but i know that most scholars don't teach it that way and then there's plenty of probably TV shows that get the lessons wrong. And so, <laughs> Tim, there's a lot of African-American stuff we ought to be reading. And um, there's so much ignorance. I am so ignorant about African-American history that I wouldn't necessarily advocate. Yeah, a lot of it's buried. Yeah, no, I'm starting to read some stuff like um, how to be anti-racist um some stories aristotle for example had this climate theory that the reason african americans were slow moving is because they they come from a hot climate it was just like what but when they were slaves they were brought into this cooler climate and aristotle was used to justify racism sexism uh western supremacy i mean so i wouldn't I'm just completely open. It completely depends upon how you use it. Um, my view is that if we don't learn these lessons, we're going to keep making these mistakes. Like what Alexis said, like, my God, we're doing all the stuff that they did. Right. And so that's that's why I teach it, because for 40 years i've watched us doing all the stuff that plato tells you not to do but you know there's lots of other stuff i haven't learned that also would be very helpful um okay so let me do what what is it that makes a society great and so this is the outline why plato thought what was great about his society. And then I want you to compare it to America, right? So come up, you think of what you think makes America great, because of course, that's politicians are definitely using, you know, make America great again. What the heck does that mean? What do you think it means? I want you to tell me, what do you think you can say what you think Trump means, but you could say, what do I think it would mean? 
Um, you don't have to bring Trump in at all, but you can if you want. Um, so uh, Plato thought his city was founded by political geniuses, create a community of citizens who have discipline, they get the education, they use the authority for the sake of the well-being of those over whom they have it. And so you have laws and institutions. I know that Minnesota has a reputation for having better laws and institutions, uh, a higher level of citizen consciousness and engagement than Arkansas. Okay, well, Arkansas is kind of on the low, you know, the bottom five, I think, in terms of people's ability or desire to think like a citizen for lots of reasons, and we can get into that, but um, at how to preserve a strong middle class, the justice system promotes rehabilitation. Um, you try to avoid invading other countries for money. Um, you work on diplomacy. You don't honor military more than it deserves. I mean, it deserves honor, but not the only honor, like the Spartans. The educational system for citizens to develop rewards people with the most commitment and ability to think about the common good. Um, and then there's an informal system of education with um, the agora, where you go on, you come on Saturday and get your stuff. And then you go over and find out what jury trials are being had, held and what's being voted on the assembly. And then you go talk to other citizens about this. You go to the theater. The theater's trying to educate you about uh, flushing out the irrational emotions. Um, the Parthenon, we went through that. Um, Let's see, the Olympics, the temple to Hephaestus. Um, I just wanted to mention that I found the books. I don't know if oh. you saw my comment in the chat. Okay, yeah. It's, yep, it's I, called Goddess Girls. Okay, Goddess I'm Girls. Screaming. Okay, well, um, I have a granddaughter and it's majority girls. I'm reading it and it's not exactly as I remember. Oh. <laughs> so it's kind of different because it's Athena and it she teaches you the life lessons. Like you're seeing her point of view and you're she's seeing the life lessons oh, okay. of the other gods. Okay. While um, also giving you the, into high school, like new territory kind of feel to appeal to little girls okay well I mean I I came to take care of my granddaughter and I happened to reading be reading a book called Circe which is about a goddess and I told her that and she was just fascinated by the fact that her grandma likes goddesses and and so I was thinking I'm not sure my son or my daughter-in-law are gonna like it if <laughs> if they find out their grandma is teaching their daughter about goddesses. I'm just not sure. So I kind of, but it was easy for her. She was fascinated by it. It's really funny. Um, the temple, it's not that my son and daughter-in-law would like totally nix it. It's just, there's, they probably have other things they want to think about. Um, let's see. Okay, the, the court system, the poets, Hephaestus, Agora, and then the analogies, right? Where's the, where are the analogies with, oh, with, here it is, Jesus and Socrates. Okay, so here's where they, um, they defeated the Persians, but then they fought against the Spartans and then they lost the war and they had a tyrant and then they overthrew him. They restored the democracy and they killed Socrates. So that's Plato's story of the rise and fall. Analogies with US history, right? 
Uh, we were we considered ourselves a democracy versus an absolute monarchy, and we were, even though we were a backwater, a uh, bunch of kicks from the sticks, we thought we had a better system in place. We had the rule of law and equality and freedom. Um, we fought World War One, World War Two, um, and then in Vietnam. It was a big question about whether we really were fighting to protect threatened democracies or we really were building an empire, right? Were there ulterior motives? And so I would, that was when I was in high school and college. And the people against the war were convinced that this is um, imperialism. This is not saving the world for democracy. Uh, but now, since then, what about the Iraq war? What about Iraq number one? What about Iraq number two? What about the war on terrorism, right? We get sold this bill of goods about we're fighting to protect democracy and we have open society, whatever. Is that true, right? Um, and then Socrates, all he does is try to make people accountable. Okay, if you say we're voting for freedom, give me some evidence. And here's some counter evidence. How do you explain that? Um, and what about rhetoric? Do you think rhetoric is uh, destroying our country? That was a major problem in Athens was people teaching future leaders how to use rhetoric and manipulate the public appeal to emotions. Um, let's see, Socrates and Jesus, and we'll go over that. How is it that people, um, a holy person is accused of being unholy? Plato was a student and then, okay. But here's what I wanna ask you. Do you think rhetoric is a problem in our society? People using words in ways that distort the truth and manipulate the public for political or economic gain. What do you think? Who wants to start? Can anybody give an example? Well, can you um, say the question again? Rhetoric. Do we have a problem with rhetoric? With um, false information or distorted information oh yes okay tim <laughs> give an example um well an example could be um uh distorted information well there was a, a trial not too long ago with johnny depp and um a lady named amber heard and a lot of information she was saying it turned out to be like a lot of lies that she kept catching up to her. And they're like, there's a whole bunch of lies and they're trying to sue people. And like the, the her lawyer trying to like, even though she knows it might not be the, the truth, she's trying to like spin it to where it can go in her favor. So I would say that's distorted a little bit. Okay. What about the coverage of Black Lives Matter? I mean, I mean, how it was covered. What about the difference between Fox News's coverage of something and CNN or something? Um, well, probably it would be different because they want to make it their own lane of how they did, how they distributed what they was doing. Probably because it's it's all all in all it's the same thing, but just a different view of how you can see it and they try to paint certain views about it. Well, it is a problem, polarization. People have a different narrative, right? People have truly different stories in their head about just about everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense to you? Oh, yes. Okay, so what about you, Zane? Do you have, have you ever had an experience where you feel like there's advertising or political rhetoric that's really trying to manipulate people? 
Uh, yeah, I think it happens like way more often than people think, actually. Uh, I mean, it's just kind of like there's obviously like extremists on both sides. Like, you know, if they're like when it comes to politics, you know, Democratic or Republic, you know, I'm not necessarily a very political person, but I mean, I can see both sides like kind of bending, you know, words and kind of scenarios and stuff like that to kind of use it to their advantage. And I think it happens on a daily basis pretty much. Yeah. So that's why you have to step back, right? and figure out how should I think about this? And also, I mean, I like to find out, just ask somebody, what do you think? And then I can see in my mind, you know, they've been fed some story that's very different from the way I look at it. And then I have to think, well, was the way I looked at it, was that fair? Was it thought through enough? Because I don't think we're going to get over polarization unless we're willing to tell somebody the way we understand the story, and then we're willing to listen and talk. Does that make sense, Zane? <laughs> okay. What, Michael, what about you? Can you think of examples where you feel like people are getting brainwashed? Um. I would say maybe like uh, with the previous presidential like election, um, more specifically like uh, like the uh, like counting like ballots basically uh, like towards the end um, there was a lot of like uh, a lot of coverage saying that there was you know there's different illegal things being done and like the the president like like President Trump like definitely had the power to determine whether or not that was like actually true or not. Um, but instead, uh, like, I feel like uh, went ahead and used the, uh, the polarized uh, social media platforms too. Okay. So there is a controversy about whether the election was stolen or not, right? Right. And so then this is really serious, right? That is how you lose the democracy right, right. there. And um, so it is important that people find out where is the information they got coming from and what did the people who were actually in charge, the secretaries of state, what did they say? Um, so that that is really, really important. Um, Ryan, Ryan, did you have, can you have an example of rhetoric? Can you hear me? I would say my example would be, I guess, immigration. I think the way the media frames like the whole idea of the wall, like it's a lot of fear mongering of if we have immigrants, then therefore jobs will be taken. If we have immigrants, therefore we'll need a bigger welfare state. If there's immigrants, therefore drugs will be more prevalent within society. And so I think that is something that, that I've seen very often. Yeah. yeah, that's a good example. What about you, Colin? Um, I mean, the English language is so easy to manipulate to make it seem what you want to be seen. Like the Oxford comma whole thing is a simple and very used like example of it. Well, actually, the Second Amendment, you know, if scholars study it and the grammar. Have you read about that? Yeah, especially recently, everyone's been going, translating it from old English to new English, um, like the whole right to bear arms. Technically, you can argue that open carry should be legal everywhere, that it's not just like guns in general for concealed so there's very gray areas and weird areas that are that we're in right now well actually i mean the scholars that i heard said i mean the only reason you could hold a gun if you wanted a a militia to protect yourself against the government right and it wasn't just it wasn't just personal use. It was just to form a citizen militia because the British 
were, you know, and to protect yourself against the British or the government. So the irony of that is that um, when the Black Lives Matter demonstration was in Washington, D.C., and they did have these National Guard or something come in and start to um, disrupt it, that would be a case where you could have a gun. <laughs> but of course, that isn't the way it's understood. Those are a bunch of liberals, you know, that are against. Uh, anyway, it was just very ironic because our founders really, it was a citizen militia. That's how you could own a gun. But of course, they all hunted and stuff like that too. But it is, there is real controversy about how to interpret the Second Amendment. And then also, you know, if you have a musket that you have to put gunpowder in every time you shoot it, that's pretty different than a, a, a machine gun. Yeah, Ryan? Well, just speaking on that, like, do you think there's ever a point where it's necessary for, I'm sorry, do you think there's ever a point where it's necessary to modify the amendments that we have? Like, I know that it's such a, a it's the backbone of our like law and everything like that. But do you think that as time changes, it's necessary for laws to change? Because we're not living in the same society as like we were 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And like, for example, I know a hot topic is, um, I mean, it's this is another polarized topic, but it's just about like firearms. Like should teachers be, you know, having that within the classroom to protect against school shooters or, sh you know, should people be able to have guns to protect themselves or whatever? Like, do you think it's necessary for laws to change as time changes or do you think it's a state of to keep shot? Well, the constitution does say that the lawmakers can make laws for public common good. That's one of the things, it's not just uh, security. So that's how it is we have the um, education and healthcare in the first place. And so that's why the liberals usually bring it up as a public safety issue, right? And they try to get data about what it is that'll make people safe. Um, but, uh, well, then the other thing, I mean, really, we need to think about, that's what I was thinking about today, okay. Our founders completely trashed the system they grew up with, absolutely leveled it to the ground and start over. And all of a sudden, the people who are the traditionalists are obsessed with keeping it the way it was when the founders, I mean, <laughs> that wasn't the spirit of the founders at all. They were completely progressive. They were way to the left. They were revolutionaries and heretics and all this stuff. They wanted a totally new paradigm. And so it's very ironic that now in the name of the founders, we're, you know, we're going backwards in terms of what's happened, women's rights, racial, you know, rights. So I think in the spirit of the founders, they created a system with case law and amendments that would be adaptable so that it didn't get so stuck in tradition that you'd have to have a revolution. Does that make sense to you? But again, people have their own opinions. I just find it very ironic. Um, so for next time, we're going to talk about um, piety. What do you think it means to be pious or righteous or holy? Or what do you think uh, a minister, what quality of character do they have that justifies them being a minister? Um, and then read the text. Socrates is meeting with this Euthyphro guy. He runs into him at the courthouse. He's a religious leader. He's taking his father to court for murder. And then he explains the situation and Socrates asks him a bunch of questions. And I should have spent more time on this and I'm sorry, I talked too much. Um, but here are the, the definitions, sort of the summary 
the of what the dialogue can thinks about and then you know that people disagree totally on what god wants capital punishment more guns abortion all this stuff so then you have to deal with that then i have some newspaper articles and i would like you to look at them because it is about after 9 11 particularly um people really thought about well does is god involved in this or what does it mean in terms of god then this article about uh, a child dying of SIDS, that was one of my best friends in high school is what she's writing about. I was at the funeral. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. I want you to go over that. Um, this is humanism. Is humanism so terrible? Um, and then some more stuff about 9-11 and how to interpret it. Okay, so start out before you even start reading what do i think holiness is and then you can also start out with which controversial issues in the political realm in the legal realm is being defended by god that i think is corrupt or that i think is legitimate or i don't think you should talk about god at all when you're dealing with laws um so does anybody have any questions? Because then I'll let you go because it's uh, 8.30. All right. So then you write some of your reactions. What did you learn most from the class? Is there anything you learned today that you think you're going to put in your um, final worldview? Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Dr. Beck. Yes? Um, where do you want us to put the answers to those questions? Well, I think I, you know, the students usually figure this out, but I think you just make a Google Doc and put just keep typing in on the same doc. And then on Friday night or Saturday morning, you post it. Do you know how to post it on the stream? Yeah, I was just assuming that I was just gonna post it to the assignment for the week like where right. you're supposed to post the yeah. paper i was just going to make two posts one with the paper one with the other um yeah here's here's the post number one right yes so yeah. i just want to make sure that i've been doing this correctly so you want three things before class three things from class right the if it's going to impact my worldview yeah then you would also like us to answer the questions that you assign well within you know same... you can yeah that's it's okay if you answer the questions instead of the three things or yeah. if you'd rather do the three things like it doesn't matter to me either. okay i was just wondering either or no, it's this is a different kind of class. You're just figuring out what you think, what's of interest to you. And sometimes those questions are something you want to write about, and sometimes they're not. So, okay. Thank you so much. Sure. We'll see you. I'll see. You.